you know, it's, it's not the, uh, many times it's not the big things that make a difference, it's the little things. And the fact that somebody would come along, you know, we've, we have a, um, my wife and I have a uh, cedar chest that was given to us years ago. Um, and uh, I can't remember the timing of it, really isn't that significant, but in that cedar chest has a lot of memories. And uh, as many of you, you know, you have different things that are significant to you. Uh, our daughter's life, I'll talk about that a little bit. I didn't plan on incorporating this part of it, though. Uh, our master's life and our daughter's life for us have both been uh, instrumental in us being where we are and who we are today. Uh, the fact that their lives were seeds, uh, and those seeds have grown into our reality. So whatever you've planted or whatever you've allowed to be significant to you is what grows into your reality. You are where you are today because of what's been planted in your life. Okay, Good or bad, good or bad. Uh, with that being said, I'm delighted that, that we uh, are able to have people that can pick up on things spiritually. And, and in that chest, we can't, I don't go to it. <laughs> I don't go to it. Because to go to that chest, and many of you that have been in our house have seen it, probably not noticed it, but have seen it. It now resides in our, grand, in our grandkids' uh, playroom. But uh, when we go through it, it takes hours. You feeling me? You know, it takes hours. And we rehearse and... and and especially her, she, she's like, I'll go in there and she's, uh, uh, you know, I'm like, you've been in the chest, haven't you? Amen. <laughs> but the delight of our father is that we get to be reunited again. Yeah. The death is not the final uh, say so. The grave doesn't have any victory over us. Amen. Most of us, if we realize our Bible and understand the revelation thereof, you won't know, you won't even experience any death sensation. God help me this morning. It just is not going to touch you. I know, I know what you've been taught, and I know some of the stuff you think, but the reality of it is, and I've heard uh, from many different people that I've been close to, some prior to their departing, or some who have gone and come back and said that the sensation of death is like, it's kind of just like taking off your shoes. You next thing you know, you're somewhere else, amen. you know? But that's the promise of the believer. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Let's just go ahead and greet. I want to greet this morning our YouTube audience. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you for taking the time to be a part of what we're doing here. I've noticed some new subscribers. Thank you very much. We appreciate you taking opportunity to tune into what we're doing here. We are located at 1221st Avenue in the city of Coralville, Iowa. Currently, we are residing at the Radisson Hotel and Conference Center just on 1st Avenue here, just off of I-80. We welcome you to come down anytime that you're in the area. Come by and see us. We'd appreciate having you here. We are here on the every Sunday at 10 a.m. and the first Sunday of every month at 5 p.m. And we welcome you to come in, tune in anytime, get something to write with, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome our YouTube audience this morning? Amen. And in keeping with that, received a prophetic confirmation this morning from someone uh, who told me some things that they could not have known except the Holy Spirit had revealed them to them regarding our building. Do not think for one minute that things are going slowly. They are not. As a matter of fact, they're going so rapidly that it almost makes my head spin. But I have to make sure that I keep my, my head in line with my spirit because my spirit is in charge of my head, not the other way around. Amen. Thank you, sir. So with that being said, I want to invite your, your attention, your careful attention this morning to Galatians, the third chapter. And I'm going to move forward. Can I have 45 minutes on the clock, please? Uh, certainly excited about some of the things that God is doing in our midst. And, you know, we don't come in second to anybody. I hope you know that. You look around and say, well, where's everybody at? That's not my concern. My concern is to ensure that I feed the ones that God sends to his house. Amen. Amen. And so I promise to feed you at such a level that you will leave here and your what you thought about God will be challenged to make sure that you know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen. I'm not here to entertain you, make you feel good or anything like that. Just going to tell you the truth. Amen. So I also want to say this before I get going. Uh, we got to vote an election coming up. Go vote. Turn to somebody on your left. Tell them go vote. Turn to somebody on your right. Tell them, go vote. And if you're not registered to vote, tell them, get registered. Come on now. Come on. We, we're too far along in this process to understand that our votes make a difference. And I want you, also, I want you to get empowered. Take a, take a deep breath. Go. Okay, because you get ready to tell them, if you don't vote, tell them on the left, if you don't vote, shut up. 
Tell them on the right. If you don't vote, shut up. Bottom line, shut up. You got nothing to say. Amen? All right. <laughs> oh, glory to God. It's going to be that kind of day. Amen? I want, to, I want to tell you real quick, you can mark your calendars for this upcoming uh, meeting, which is going to be held January 31st through February the 2nd. It is our Empowered in Spiritual and Financial Leadership Conference. Uh, Empowered in Spiritual and Financial Leadership Conference. Many of us, uh, hold my clock, please. Many of us actually, uh, we get empowered spiritually, but our finances are weak. Maybe a different crowd, I don't know, but I know that just because I was born again didn't mean that I was financially secure and sound. I was still making decisions that, that were leading me down paths that didn't bring me to the place I know God wants me to be. And so one of the, I, I've said this before, our churches don't suffer from a lack of leadership. Many times they suffer from a lack of good leadership. And incidentally, you cannot, you cannot determine the magnitude of a ministry by the amount of members that ministry has. You can reach millions upon millions of people if you do it the right way. And that right way is God's way. Amen. So this conference is designed. It's going to be held at the uh, at the country and the suites here in town. And it's going to be held in the evening and more details will come. You'll see some emails there. But I want you to mark your calendars for that. Uh, we're bringing in two gentlemen that are, are more than capable and qualified to teach on this material. And one of them is such a, a financial uh, whiz that you're going you gonna to want to hear this. Um, my wife and I sit on the board of directors of one ministry and we were at a meeting in uh, Madison, Wisconsin not long ago and at that meeting uh, the gentleman uh, that began to speak, he, I was mesmerized because I hadn't heard things that were spiritually relevant and pertinent like this in a long time in the, in the realm of finances. Amen? It's more than just giving tithes. Say amen to that. More than just giving tithes. Amen. So mark your calendars for that. We're delighted for that now. The book of Galatians, if you would start my time. Galatians 3, and I'm going to start at verse 13. I'm reading from the expanded Bible, so please stay with me. Christ took away the curse the law put on us. He changed places with us. Listen to this now. He changed places with us and put himself under that curse. It is written in the scriptures, anyone whose body is displayed or hung on a tree is cursed. Glory to God. Now, write down this scripture. I'm not going to go there, but I want you to write it down for your own study and reference. That's Deuteronomy 21 and 23. In that, you'll also find the significance of why Jesus could not be hung in the city. Come on, somebody. He needed to be hung outside of the city. And so you need to understand that Christ fulfilled the law based on what the law was of the day. Verse 14, Christ did this so that God's blessing, which was promised to Abraham, might come through Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Jesus died so that by our believing, the spirit of, we could receive the spirit that God promised. Do you see the word believing or by faith? Same thing. You need to mark it just so you understand. When people come up to you and they try to accuse you of not keeping the, pro the proper regiment of the word, you have to understand that you're not called to keep the proper regiment. You are called to believe in Jesus Christ by faith. It does not excuse us from somehow or another thinking that we can be willy-nilly or loose with God's word or his promises. What it does, though, it brings us into a closer ability to have relationships. Say relationship. This is about relationship. This is not about law keeping. So with that being said, let's keep going. I want to skip down. Uh, you can read verse, verse 15 uh, on your own. I'm going to keep going. Let's skip down to verse 19. Verse 19 says, so what was the law for? It was given to show that the wrong things people do are against God's will. Again, make a note of this. The wrong things that people do are against God's will. And it continued until the special descendant. Who is that special descendant? Thank you very much. Who had been promised came. The law was given through angels who used Moses for a mediator to give the law to people. But a mediator, mediator, verse 20, is not needed when there is only one side and God is only one. Again, you can read verses 21, 22 for yourself to keep it in context. I'm going to go to 23. This will be my main jumping off point. But before this faith came, we were all held prisoners by the law. We had no freedom until God showed us the way of faith that was coming. Verse 24, in other words, the law was our guardian. Hallelujah. 
Christ, excuse me, it was our, our guardian leading us to Christ so that we could be made right with God. Now, please understand this. The law did not make anyone right with God. It was the guide. It was the mile marker on the highway, the sign, as it were, if you were driving from I-80 and never been to Davenport before and you were heading east, you needed to have a sign that showed you were, you were on the right track. That's why those signs are there. The law was a steering, a guide to get you to the place where Jesus Christ could accept you by faith so that you and I could get to our destination without having to stop at every toll booth along the way. Amen. Without having to pay excess baggage fees. Come on, somebody. What God does is he places his spirit inside of us and says, this is the way I want you to go. If you follow my way, you will get to your destination without having all of the challenges that come from not, not being prepared for your trip. You ever been on a trip and not been prepared? Forgot something. Can I tell on myself for a minute? I'll tell on my wife, more likely. That's what I do. Look, everybody, look at her. This is what we do. We travel a lot. We got up the highway on one of our recent trips, and we had, we had gone, and I don't know how far we were, maybe about 10 miles, and she said to me, I forgot. I know what that means. It means make a U-turn. Don't, don't go past gold. Do not collect $200. Don't say anything smart. Just turn the car around and go back, and let's get it. That's what it means after 35 years of marriage. That's what I'm saying to you, okay? Well, what the Holy Ghost does, the Holy Spirit does, is he will tell you, listen, I know the rule, help me, I know the rule is there, but you're not held to the rule. You're held to whether or not, as the scripture says here, whether or not it's wrong in the sight of God. Right. Amen. I'm going to say that again because I know that's like, what? The rules are there. The rules of the game are there. Yeah. <laughs> if I, long as I don't cheat, you can't cheat God. Right. Come on. You might, might forget the rule. You might violate the rule. But God is not in the business of rule keeping. He's in the business of love giving. He's in the business of making sure that your relationship stays intact. So if you somehow or another slip up and trip over the rule because you didn't know it, many people trip over rules they don't even know are there. And depending on what church you go to and what fellowship you're a part of, there's rules on top of rules on top of rules. And I've gone through that many times. I'm going to go through it today. But I didn't know that I couldn't wear this in church. And so all of a sudden it's become a rule that I didn't know was there. I violated in the eyes of people. I am not worthy of what God has already said I am worthy of. How are you going to override God? Who are you in the first place? Who are you? I better not say turn to your neighbor and say that one, but anyway. <laughs> Y'all get it, amen? Let's keep going. So again, verse 23, before this faith came, we were all held prisoners by the law. We had no freedom until God showed us the way of faith that was coming. In other words, verse 24, the law was our guardian or signpost, as it were, as I said, uh, leading us to Christ so that we could be made right with God. That's all God ever wants. Tell your neighbor, that's all God ever wants. He just wants you to be right with him. For some people, that's not, gonna, that's not always going to look the same, ladies and gentlemen. That's the reason why this church exists. If it doesn't exist for that, I don't know why else we're here. Hmm. Help me, Lord. Because ultimately, I don't qualify for a lot of the other uh, high-profile, you know, well-attended places. I don't qualify. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Because I don't fit in. I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and they were telling me about their experience and all this stuff. And, and I, I watched part of the presentation that the people were having and they were very well uh, dressed and presented and very polished. And, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that's not that's not me. That's just not me. I, I mean, you know, I don't have any problem. You see me most of the time, uh, any day other than Sunday, for the most part, you're going to see me in jeans. And some people would argue, well, why don't you wear jeans on Sunday? Because the Lord hasn't given me that liberty. You wear what you want to wear. I didn't tell you what you have to wear. You don't tell me what I have to wear. Amen. I listen to him. Why? Because my relationship dictates what I, how I present myself. Are you feeling me? My relationship also dictates what I do and don't do. Not a set of rules. And when we minimize the gospel to a set of rules, it is very weak indeed. 
And that's what, the, that's what the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Judaizers, that's what they had done for so long. And as we said last week and the week before, that's what they brought into this church. They were trying to infiltrate the church, and now all of a sudden they wanted to fit their own, their own comfort zone. And that's what people will do. They, 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 want, they, you know, they want you to have, you know, they want to come in with, with looking good. With a, you know, maybe some of y'all can't relate to this example, but some of y'all can. You know, come in with a, with a great big briefcase, great big Bible, with a big old hat on and want somebody to carry it for them, and they think they're doing something. Huh? Or, or, or somehow or another, they want you to conform to what they have. You know, I, I, I'm really going to be good but bad this morning. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I know people that, that all they wear is long dresses. And to me, it's, it, you know, unless it's, unless it's, <laughs> I got to be careful here. Unless it's worn well, it doesn't necessarily, it's not attractive to me. I don't want my wife wearing long dresses down to now. I, I haven't seen what anybody has on in here, okay? So pull in your religious toes, all right? Elder Dave, help me, help me turn to determine how many times I said it. But 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 what I'm saying to you is there's some people that mandate that. Yeah. Gotta have a little thing on the back of the head, or they're not holy. So if I go to their group and I'm not, you know, if I'm a woman and I don't have a long dress and I don't have a little doily on the back of my head, all of a sudden there's something wrong with me. Oh, I thought I was talking. Okay, all right. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. What? What? Where did that come from? What? Where does that come from? You are, verse 26, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves. Do you see? It says have clothed yourselves with Christ. In Christ, there is no difference between Jew and Greek, right? Slave or free person, male and female, you are all the same in Christ Jesus. You belong to Christ. Yes. It is a dangerous thing to put your hands, your mouth, your, 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 your comments, your chat room, dissertation, whatever it is, the, on, on God's people because they don't belong to you. I believe many Christians will, you know, and, and you can say what you want. You don't have to agree with me. I'm not looking for agreement per se in this regard. But I believe many Christians struggle in their, in their lives with not seeing the manifested blessing. We talked about last week. There's, there's two types of blessing. The first blessing is the blessing of Abraham that every believer in Christ Jesus, true believer in Christ Jesus has. Amen. That's just the only thing that qualifies you for it. We just read it. Galatians 3.13. Say amen to that. The other blessing is the blessings that come into your life because of your obedience to listen to God and do what he tells you to do. I, if I need a house, it's not I, I have I have a right to the house, but I may not have the house. And just because I have a right to something doesn't mean that I'm going to get something. Oh, help me, God. Many people just because and I was where I was going with that is just because they're believers. They think that they can just do anything, say anything, act any way. And that God's just going to automatically bless them because I'm blessed with Abraham. It don't work like that. You do have to qualify for these things by your own obedience. Or attention to the word. So, so when we find ourselves not manifesting or these things showing up in our life, don't look, don't look outward and say, what's wrong with them? Say, what's wrong with me? Y'all quiet this morning on me. Okay, keep going. Are y'all all right? Okay, so you will, he says here, verse 29, you belong to Christ, so you are Abraham's descendants. King James says what? Seed. And it says only one. There's not more than one seed here, to be clear. You inherit, you will inherit all of God's blessings because of the promise God made to Abraham. Now, in order to understand it, I'm not going to go there this morning because I just hear the Lord say something else. But you have to go back and find out what the blessings that Abraham inherited. Right. Oh, yes. The blessings that Abraham inherited, we talked about them a little bit last week, healing. Yes. Let me ask this question. Some of you know this answer. Um, when, when God preached the gospel, we read it last week, to Abraham... Where was the law? Was the law in existence? No. How long before the law was going to show up? 430 years later. Do you hear what I'm saying? So what God is doing is he's establishing in Abraham the way he wants to treat his man, woman, man, human, on the earth, on the planet. So, so the law comes along 
like we just said, the law comes to steer people to get them, like I said about the road sign, to let them know that sin is not going to work. Pray with me this morning. I, I, feel a, I feel a resistance and I don't know where it's coming from. So. Hallelujah. Master, we yield to you. I give myself over completely to you. Holy Spirit, I welcome your presence in such a strong and dynamic way. Speak truth to your people. Let them hear from you, not from me. Use me as your vessel, but let them hear from you today. I expect, God, that when I pray, I believe I receive when I pray. So I know fully well that every obstacle, we bound the spirit of the enemy today. We've come against every spirit of witchcraft, sorcery in the name of Jesus, casting down imaginations. And we've received the truth of God's word in advance of it coming forth. We are your children. We receive by faith. In Jesus' name, say amen. amen. So with that, what begins to happen and what has happened is that you have gotten these things already. Most of us go about our lives having been taught erroneously that we need to pray to get them. I challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. I'm here to challenge you. I'm not here to just stand up here and be an orator to you. I'm here to challenge you. You will not see, if at all, where Abraham spent a lot of time asking God for things. If anything, if nothing else, what God had to do was change Abraham's thinking to start thinking like him. Yeah. Yeah. So he takes him out. He positions him so he can see the stuff. Now, you know, good and well, if he said, look, look and see the stars of the sky. What time of day was it? Night. Why do we know that? Because <laughs> stars can't be seen in the daytime. You see how simple that revelation is? So with that being said, he's dealing with him and he's saying to him, in essence, and this is what Paul has picked up on. I have already given you all of these things. They are yours, not for the uh, not for the asking, but for the believing. Yes. So it takes our faith and it makes our faith necessary to grow so we can stop asking for things that God has already given us. I don't have to ask. She doesn't have to ask me for the car keys. She got her own. She didn't have to ask for the keys to the house. We, we're one. I mean, I, think about it now. I mean, I, I like to use my, you know, many times uh, TJ's not here this morning. David's not here this morning. But, I, you know, they have access to everything that I have. Right. If they need something and I don't have it, then that's when the asking and the going back and forth takes place. But is there anything that you could ever need from God that he doesn't have? So, so what we need to do, you have to do it right now, but what you need to do is you need to make a list and start crossing some stuff off to stop asking for. Stop asking for healing. It's already yours. Stop asking for prosperity. Your bills paid, being out of debt. It's already yours. And if it's not showing up in your life, don't come under condemnation. Get back in faith and say, why isn't it showing up? Amen. Right? What else could possibly anything in the covenant that God has given to Abraham? The Bible says that this is ours. It belongs to us. So people that hate on prosperity, hate on healing. Good God, I don't know how you could hate on healing. You know, I have I have a thought that most people that hate on healing have never been sick. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, or, the, or, the, or the old crazy thought that, well, you know, God gave me this sickness to, to, to teach me something. Well, you know, I mean, if you're going to ask that question, if you're going to say that, make that statement, I got a question for you. Where did he get it from? Yeah. Ain't no sickness in heaven. Yeah. Would he steal it from somebody? Yeah. I'm going to steal the cancer from somebody and give it. No, that's foolishness. Yeah. Just like the statement that God, right? Okay. Y'all all right? Yeah. Let's keep going. Praise God. All right. I want to make a couple statements for it to you real quick. See, one of the things that you see in Galatians that, that I've seen, and I'm teaching Galatians in a different way. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm using exactly what the Holy Spirit gives me from the scripture. 
you know, the term is exegesis, but I, I'm using this so I can, I can hear him. Because, you know, I think about it from the standpoint of the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul, Peter, James, John, all of them, okay? I believe that when they stood up, I don't believe that they had, uh, you know, 10 points and a, you, you know what I'm saying? I, I, don't be, I believe they were inspired by the Holy Ghost and just spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. I believe that. You don't have to believe it. I believe it. With that being said, with this, I've endeavored to do this because here, here we are. We're getting ready to hit a, hit a, hit a um, uh, what's the word I want to use? I might have it in my notes, but let me see. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a significant place, but that's not the word I want to use. But we're, we're, we're getting ready to hit something that has, God has been, I believe, by the Holy Spirit, been trying to get us to. So let me say a couple things here. With Galatians, you don't see any of the corrective tones in this book as you see in uh, such books as the first and second Corinthians, written by Paul, or even Romans. You don't see those. You don't see those corrective tones. Please either make a note of that, write it down, or understand it, whichever works best for you. Doesn't mean that the Galatians didn't need correcting, but rather what it means, I believe, by the spirit of the word, what it means is that Paul was taking a people group, say people group, and we've not been good at this. We've not been good at this. I know I haven't because I wasn't raised this way. I had to get this way by revelation from God, and he's blessed me this way. Uh, but I, it's hard for me to take out of context the book of Romans and apply it to my life without knowing the culture of who the Romans were. Particularly, particularly who? The Jews in Rome. Paul's not writing uh, a blanket to every every uh, people group in Rome. There are some on the fringes who have been become born again. And so he begins to speak. And as they they come across, let me borrow your notebook, just a notebook. Uh, when they when they come across the, the writings of this man of God and somebody else's maybe, you know how it goes. We tell, well, I heard this. I heard so and so preach this and this and that. And they started hearing it. The truth, even if they weren't Jews, the truth started registering in their hearts because of who? Who said Holy Spirit? You're exactly right. Because of the Holy Spirit. Now, stay with me now because I'm going somewhere. That being said, so when I read, I cannot be guilty of taking something out of context that does not apply. The first, the, the Corinthians, I was sharing with, with someone this, this past week at my home, the Corinthians, they were a vile people group. They were very humanistic. They were extremely uh, undereducated. They were, they were, they, the Jews thought of them as dogs. They were people that were simply not worthy to even be on the same side of the street as the Jews in their opinion. This is the Corinthian church. They were uh, very uh, ritualistic and ceremonial. They would take their kids because they had come, they had come out of the, the people groups that had been conquered by the Romans. They had come in and some were allowed to keep their cultural practices, some were not. So whoever the Romans determined were that, that the people group was worth keeping, they allowed them to practice certain things as long as it didn't bother them bother the Romans. And so what happened with the Corinthians, the Corinthians were, they were despicable people, uh, not, not, not by uh, nature, but by culture. Come on now, there are some people that practice some things that, you know, I know there's some people, some mountain folk in the United States of America that practice some things that I don't want, I don't want to be anywhere near when they practice them. Y'all ain't saying that this morning, but there might be some people in your, your, your mountain folk lineage you know, old Uncle Dirty Danny that don't nobody want to talk about. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and so, but point being is that these people were so contemptible, so vile. So Paul starts addressing point by point the things that he's hearing report of, telling them, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And he's telling them why not to do it. I don't know how mature this group is this morning, but I believe God's got me in the right group because I'm going to take this to a whole nother level. Sin is sin all day long. But sin is not defined strictly by the words of that book. If you think it is, you are sadly mistaken. Just like the blessing is not defined just by the words of that book. What defines and what can be verified as sin is what takes place in your heart. Jesus is calling somewhere. 
I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, just kidding. My phone went off the other day in the middle of TV taping, man. It went off like three times. I was like, ah. Anyway, so what, what you cannot be guilty of, and listen, because I'm bringing this back to Galatians, he writes these series of letters he writes to the church at Ephesus. Read the letters in the context of his writing, not in the generality that we've always been taught the way they should. Like we, we apply this blanket salvation to everybody, and yet everybody doesn't come to God the same way. Amen. Salvation is through Jesus Christ in him alone, to be clear. Now, I have not deviated and I'm not deviating. I'm trying to get you out to, in your thinking to a place where you understand that God's desire is that all would be saved. So with that being said, then, when I look now and I see Galatians, I see Galatians in the context of the writing. He's explaining to a people who were not necessarily as vile as the Corinthians and were not nearly as as uh, uh, astute as the Jews. But he's got a group of people who grew up in and most of them were, were of a uh, uh, Mongolian, for lack of a better term, uh, people group. They that what we call Occidental or we would call uh, uh, Asian persuasion type thing that's not all of them but that would be uh, accurate for your understanding they're not knowing about Jesus Christ they don't know nothing about this dude they don't know anything about all of the stuff that he had to go through as he walked the, the, the path to, to Golgotha he, they don't know this stuff they don't know the promises to Abraham they don't know them and if they do know them they've only heard a little bit about them help me now what happens is God hand picks and I love how God hand picks us and in his hand picking, many times we get frustrated because we want to be like somebody else. If God wanted you to be somebody else, he'd have made you somebody. He made you who you are so that you can open your Holy Ghost filled mouth, your great revelatory knowledge and use it to bless somebody else. He hand picks Saul who is now Paul, and he sends him to a people group. Paul has the educational wherewithal to be able to stand before them, and he could articulate Judaism and the law of Moses like none other, none of his peers. The Bible says that. But he doesn't choose to take his knowledge to the people. He chooses to take the spirit of the living God. He chooses to take the power of God to them and say, listen, this is who Jesus Christ really is. Yeah. And he does not bring any legality into it. Help me, God. He doesn't bring a bunch of do's and don'ts into it. Y'all read it for yourselves. Are you hearing me? And in this process of doing this, what is he doing? He is letting them know that these things are available to you, even if you don't meet the criteria of the Judaizers, even if you don't, didn't grow up in a Jewish household, even if you don't know the, the Pentateuch, even if you don't know, it, it doesn't matter. And we have made it a priority in our churches. Most of the reason why people struggle in Christianity today is because they stand up before people who have a condemning message. And before they can even get in the door, get out of the car in the parking lot, we are judging them based on what they wear. We are judging them based on what they look like, what ethnicity they are, or what educational uh, success they've accomplished. The devil is a liar. The Bible says that there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. All are accepted by the Lord. I know I'm preaching this morning. I ain't saying it, but I know it. Because the reality of what God is trying to do in this day and age is get the mindset of the church changed. And it is a huge obstacle. My God, come on now. I can only look at myself and remember, you know, I was rehearsing with my brother the other day over lunch and we were rehearsing where we came from and all the struggles. And we have struggled in our ministries from the concept of thinking that we had to begin to bring people into this whole. It's like bringing people into a, a, a funnel like cattle into a into a into a corral where they've got the fences up and everybody's got to come the same way. But the fences are torn down. My God. And if God's going to get his greatest out of this church and out of the church of the living God, he's going to have to tear down your fences too. Yes. You're going to have to start looking at it differently. If not, you're going to find yourself on the outside wondering what happened. I, did, I defy the devil this morning. There is no way that I'm going to come here to Iowa and to spend my life in service to the people of God and to the master himself and not see the fullness of God in the land of the living. I will not do it. 
I will not allow it to be so. Thank you, Lord. Say amen, somebody. How much time I got? I'm getting happy, so I got to slow down. With the folks in, in, in the church of Galatia, again, I told you, it wasn't just one church. It was a series. It was a people group, a series of churches. He doesn't take that corrective tone. To take that corrective tone with them means to lose them because they didn't. They, it wasn't that they didn't know that sleeping with your, your daddy's wife, you know, which was not your mama. Because that's what he said over Corinthians. Was wrong. They knew that. It wasn't that they didn't know that, 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 that somehow or another, you know, I couldn't cheat somebody on a business deal for my own advantage. They didn't have to know that there was a law against it. They just knew that ain't right. Just like you and I know that ain't right. Cheating on your taxes. That ain't right. And it is the, the dangerous position is to have something that you know isn't right and do it anyway. Yes. Yes. That's the danger. Yes. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you, you read your Bible for yourself. It is not my job to, to read your Bible for you. Right. It is your job to read your Bible for yourself. Yes. But I'm not going to sit here and come up with, you know, this is a sin, that's a sin, that's a sin, that's a sin. I will not do it, except the Holy Spirit tell me to do it. And most of the time, he ain't telling me to do that. Because that's not this kind of church. And I said, that's not this kind of church. Yeah. Well, then what kind of church? It's a church of life. Yeah. It's a church of revelation. If you're not getting revelation, you know, the way I preach and the way I'm teaching, if you ain't getting revelation from it, you are clearly in the wrong place. Because if you're looking for milk and butter and, 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 and honey and sweet kind of stuff, you need to go to some other church. Because you're going to get meat. Most of the time, you're going to get meat. You're going to get a ribeye, Fort Worth ribeye. A, a, you're going to get, a, a, you know, and I apologize uh, only slightly to all of my vegans and vegetarian, uh, uh, you know, fellow, you know, whatever. But I'm just telling you that give me some good old Iowa pork chops. Something that I can, I need a knife to cut this thing. And it, I, I can put it in my mouth and I have to chew on it a little bit. But by the time it goes down, Amber, I'm in good company. And with me, throw some mushrooms on that joker, keep the onions to yourself. I'm real good. So when I preach to you like this, I'm throwing mushrooms in the pot. I'm throwing steak. I'm throwing potatoes, broccoli, whatever it else you can eat, whatever. I, I don't like that. Well, put it to the side and keep eating. <laughs> huh? Corn, somebody said cornbread. My God. Cornbread. Huh? Come on, collard greens. I don't do no okra. Ham bone. Ooh, I came in here hungry. <laughs> Black eyed peas, some rice. Ooh, some good old gravy. Biscuits that melt in your mouth. Oh my goodness. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Ooh, glory. Let me let me let me get done. What had, what had happened? I opened this door. So what had happened? See what had happened was what happened with the Galatians is this is what happened with them. And I'm purposely not going into chapter 4 cuz cuz I'm going to get there but I'm purposely not today. But what happened with them is they had stopped using their minds. And they were not allowing the word that had been preached to them to be mixed with faith. In other words, Paul comes in, he preaches and teaches Christ. He talks to them about the law versus, I mean, legalism versus uh, faith and liberty. He tells them all these things and they're excited. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God was right there orchestrating every word that came out of Paul's mouth. Every word. Every word. Just like today. Collard greens came straight from the Holy Ghost. You do what you want to do with it. Amen. But with that being said, it'd be like this. Listen to me. It'd be like this. It'd be like you guys hearing this, especially you that, that are consistent with, with, with light point and teaching. It'd be like you hearing this and then going out there and letting somebody say, well, listen, we want you to come to our church. But in order to come to our church, you got to do this. 
And, and wait a minute, that's not the end. And you do it. I'm going to tell you another bad scenario. When you and I get out into the marketplace or we get out on our jobs or whatever, and we're telling people about Jesus Christ, and we're talking to people about faith, and we can't back up what we say. Yes. Because I'm going to tell you something. Most legalistic people know the word. The problem is that the letter kills. And the spirit gives life. So most of them, they're caught up in the letter of the word. That's why they, that's why they you know, uh, constantly berate you or, or berate us or, you know, whoever the way we believe about, well, you know, you're just that name it and, gl- name it and claim it. But no, we're not. I'm activating the word. Yeah. I'm acting like the word is real. And, and the Bible says that in the beginning, John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And, the, and you're feeling me. So I'm activating. So so and we know everything in the kingdom is what activated voice activated. So you got to know you got to know what you believe and why you believe it. That's why I teach like this. Amen. So so they had stopped using their minds and we're now allowing the word uh, just to, the faith stopped coming. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, please. You know, I, I, I'm not going to tell you pulling religious toes because this is. Pulling stupidity toes. Because this is not even religious toes. Not for this group. If you ain't figured out by now that, that faith is what is going to get you over, Amen. you're being stupid. <laughs> if Paul can say, oh, foolish Galatians, I can say, oh, stupid people. Amen. That don't mean I'm talking to you. I'm just saying. But if it slaps you in the face, you stupid. <laughs> just saying. Because she and I, now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I, and I'm going to help you. How much time I got? I'm going to tell you because see, cause see, I recognize, I don't, I don't, thank you. I don't, I don't, now I don't now I'm just going to tell you, give you a little insight into our household, okay? Because y'all don't live there. Say amen to that. Amen. 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 <laughs> no, you can't live with me. I ain't wanting to live with you either. Anyway, but, but we don't get every little Every little word, right? We ain't no word police in my house. We have disciplined ourselves to find out. I was, I was at, I was at a grocery store uh, yesterday. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, <clears throat> pardon me. Yesterday evening, I was at a grocery store, and I was going in the store. When I got in the store, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in the parking lot, and I, I have to believe. You can just help me here. Thank you. I have to believe that the reason why the Holy Spirit had me park because I didn't park normally where I would park. Thank you. Excuse me. I parked way at the other end. And this is how he talks to me. OK, this is me. OK, so y'all know how he talks about my, with me when I'm walking my dog. So this is another way. So I'm park, I park way down at the other end of the parking lot and I start walking up the sidewalk. As I'm walking up the sidewalk, another couple who had parked their car and uh, was parked in a parking spot. And there was an older, you know, elderly lady pulling up. She wasn't going fast by God's grace. And I saw a lady with one child. She she jumped up on the part on the on the sidewalk in front of me. So I'm still walking, and then all of a sudden I hear her say, "No, no!" And 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 uh, there's a there's a, you know you know where this is going. One of her other little children was trying to catch up with her, and the husband was distracted, and so the child darted in front of the car. But but it wasn't the, 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 to the lady's credit. You know some people speed through the parking lot. I hope that's not a, none of y'all. Some people don't stop at the thing that says stop. That's why it's not suggested stop. It means really stop. OK, people are walking anyway. So so anyway, so this is where I'm going with this. So the, the husband comes up and he's trying to make light like nothing happened. I'm thinking that ain't nothing to make light of. But she says she turns around to him and tells him, see, I told you, it's only a matter of time before something is going to happen. And one of them gets hit. Y'all know better than that. Now, what do y'all think? What do y'all think? What, what do y'all think? What, no, really, what do you think? Do you think that, oh, well, she was just, she didn't mean it. Then why'd she say it? Then why'd she say it? Because see, because the power of what? Death and life. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And he that love it, the Bible says, will eat the fruit thereof. So this is her reality. Instead of her, and instead of her saying, you know, something protective over them, even if it wasn't biblical. But she went to the place where none of us ever, I don't want to see a child hit. You know what I'm saying? 
But they don't. But the con the connection between the two of them is not always there. So with that being said, you have to understand that you are you cannot live this walk without faith. And you say, well, I don't have the same faith as you, Pastor. That is a lie. Yes. Scripturally, that's a lie. Yes. Turn to Romans twelve real quick. Hold your place. Romans twelve. Thank you, Jesus. Don't ever say, I don't have the same faith as you, Pastor. No, what you don't have is the same, same activity and growth in your faith as me. Because our faith has grown from where we started. I tell you all the time about how we started, man. We started not knowing nothing, having 20 people in our house. You know what I'm saying? I told y'all that last week. I couldn't believe I told the story. I was like, man, why did I say that? Because it was true. Romans 12, verse 1. So, brothers and sisters, since God has shown us great mercy, I beg you to offer your lives as a living sacrifice to him. Your offering must be only for God and pleasing to him, which is the spiritual right way for you to worship. Not the literal, not the letter. It is the spiritual way for you to worship. Verse 2. Do not be shaped by this world. Instead, be changed where? Within by a new way of what? Thinking or renewing your mind. Then you will be able to decide what God wants for you. You will know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. Verse 3, because God has given me or you, this one says special gift. I have something to say to everyone among you. Do not think you are better than you, than you are. You must decide what you really are. What does verse 3 say in the King James Bible? Somebody read it out to me. Stop right there. That's good. According as God has dealt to every man, what? It doesn't say A. The measure. It's measured out to each one of us according. Let me close. In conclusion, I'm going to close with this. Okay? Thank you, Lord. So don't stop mixing your, don't stop mixing your faith, okay? It doesn't work any other way. You know? I, I mean, I want to see you every Sunday. If I don't see you every Sunday, you still need to be living by faith. Once you, once, you put yourself, once you put yourself out there, we talked about this years over the past eight years of this ministry. Once you put yourself out there as being a part of Christ's gang, you know what I'm saying, as being part of Christ's gang, you are, you, you are marked for destruction by the enemy. Yes. And if he can't get to you, he'll certainly try to get to one of your children. He'll try, to keep, he'll try to get to your animals. He'll mess, try to mess up your furnace in your house, your stove, your dishwasher. He don't care. He's going to try to get in your house some way. And a lot of times he'll use people that don't have your best interest at heart. And a lot of them, we have our family members, whether we like it or not. Our family, if they don't believe like you, they think you a nut. They think you crazy. If they had their way, they'd commit you to, to, to the fourth floor. Amen. I know I'm right about it. I know. I know. Okay. All right. So we now begin... We now here's here's where we're going, and this is what I said. This is the transitional point. This, that's what I was trying to say earlier. This is the transitional point. What now begins to happen is we now begin to see the significance of John 12, 24. You need to write that down. John 12, 24. It's becoming a reality for all people, also being preached at a high level by someone other than the original disciples. I'm gonna say that again. I didn't I didn't mean for you to write that down, but you can. I'll say it again if you want to. We now begin to see the significance of John 12, 24 becoming a reality for all people. And also, it is being preached at a high level by someone other than the original disciples. Let me say that so I can, I can, I can close. I got one more point. Can y'all take one more point after that? Okay. What is happening, John 12, 24. What does John 12, 24 say? If you didn't turn to it, I want you to turn to it. What does it just say? Who knows? What does it say? Don't turn to it. If you turn to it, I don't want you to read it. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and dies. It abides alone. But if it dies, it does what? Brings forth much fruit. Okay. Y'all got that, right? That was something. Look up at me. That was something that the disciples, James, Peter, John, so on and so forth, all heard the Lord say. They heard him say it. They were there the day he said it. Okay, He says that, and he's, he, they're clearly now, by this point, understanding that he's talking about his own death. Now, they understand that the back half of that verse is more critical than the first half. The first half says, 
it gives the appearance that that not everybody in this case, he's talking about himself. Not everybody is going to make the choice to die. We know that's true. The reason why you and I are here today is because you've died to yourself, even if you just did it today, because self would have said, stay home. It's too cold. And many people heard that same thing and did it. But you didn't. You died to yourself today. Y'all see that, right? That's a good place to, you know, pat yourself on the back. Okay. That being said, but the back end is the critical end because what they heard was that when it dies, it will not abide alone. But if it dies, it will do what? Bring forth much fruit. That's why you and I are here today. Because the prophetic utterance of the Lord had to come to pass because John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth because now the truth has been spoken. And what it's doing is preparing us for where we are today. It was also preparing the, 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 the uh, disciples that were there for their ministry. However, say however. There were no Galatians present, at least not that we can indicate. And, and Paul was not there. That's important. We've been talking. What have we been talking about all year long? Learning the potential in every seed. Right. Did y'all forget that because I ain't been saying it. OK. That being said, now Paul picks up. Hallelujah. Paul picks up by revelation that the seed of which is Jesus Christ has now fallen into the ground by his death. He has now placed his blood at the mercy seat of the father, which was what? Because for all of the criminal offenses of mankind that had been committed, that were being committed and that would forever be committed. Jesus's blood was there to remit and to to renounce sin, eradicate it forever from mankind. Paul was the writer of that. Where did he get it? By revelation. He gets it and he says it to the Galatians and he tells the Galatians, don't be concerned about the rule keeping and the Judaizers. Be concerned about the fact that Christ has set you free. Amen. That was his message. Amen. And nobody else taught it to him because he says, and we've read this, he says that when I went up to Jerusalem, what did I do? I didn't, I didn't, I, I went to see James and Peter. Come on, y'all know this. And when I got there, what did he say? They didn't add anything to my message. In other words, I'm good. I'm on good ground here. Y'all looking at me like a calf at a new gate. <laughs> I, right? Y'all know this, right? But you're starting to see it in what God is trying to bring it into pass in your life. Why? Because the next monumental thing that Paul says, oh my God, he starts talking about you people have been set up for the power which is to come from the Holy Ghost. You didn't have to wait in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost. You get it because I say receive ye the Holy Ghost. My God. I get it because I lay my hands on you and God has empowered me to do it. That's how cool that is. I ain't got to tarry. I just got to receive. But I got to believe I receive when? When I pray. And now all of a sudden, what has happened? The next thing, and I'm not, again, I'm going to stop short here, but the next thing he starts talking about is the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, my God, I just, I, I just want to just jump into it right now. Because, see, the, close your Bible. See, the fruit of the Spirit is more than just what we, we get this little, little, little uh, balloon-type picture like some, you know, cartoon, and we see a little apple and a little pear and a little orange and a little this and a little that. And I've actually heard people teach it like somehow or another, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, and, and they want to try to color it up like it's some little heart fruit. The devil is a liar. Only way you get the manifestation, I told you, it is nine manifestations of one fruit, ladies and gentlemen. And if you read your Bible right, it is the power of the Holy Ghost that has come unto mankind. And by faith, I believe that I can walk in love. Love, as the song says, has a name. Oh, my God. Love has a name. His name is Jesus. Now, all of a sudden, all the blocks, all the legal uh, uh, ramifications, all the legal hurdles have been moved out of my heart. Now I can open myself up and love can come fill me up. Long suffering joy. Come on, somebody. Now he's there. He's there. He is the one making sure that no matter what I go through, Robin, no matter how ugly. We had a lady that, that fussed us out yesterday and she was as wrong as two left shoes. Right up the street from my house. We pulled up to the intersection and I intentionally paused because I don't like, I, I want to make sure everybody going to stop at a four-way stop sign. Yeah, amen. Amen. Dear God, help me. I don't know, I better not say that. 
I learned, I learned to drive in New York. I said, New York. You couldn't get no license at 14 and 15. Some people don't need a license at 14 and 15. Some people don't need one at 45. I'm sitting at the stop sign. She's sitting on my right. We're getting ready to go. And I'm there and I'm, I've got long enough to pause, which is what I do. In most cases, very rare that I don't. Unless there's nobody around. And all of a sudden, this lady, she pulled out in front of me and she doing all this. Because st I started going into the intersection. She was upset. And I said, wow, what is she upset about? Because she ain't got no love in her. I hope y'all ain't doing that. Y'all better stop cutting people off on the highway. God gave you some appendages. None of them was to ever demonstrate to anybody love. <laughs> so you see the significance of John 12, 24. We're going to get into that. We're going to go through chapter four and roll on. Lastly, I'm going to say this. Please, please hear me well. And we close. And that is, don't you ever allow yourself. And this is this has been a monumental shift in my thinking, since, especially since I've been pastoring this church. But even before that, when I was in Texas, don't let your experience be what you declare to be truth in your life. Good or bad. Good or bad. A lot of people say, well, you know, uh, 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 I don't know. I got a check in the mail. Woohoo! God is good. He good long before that check ever showed up in your life. That's who he is. He's just good. Or somebody say, well, excuse me, somebody might say, well, you know, I know a bunch of Christians that don't get it. I do too, but that don't change God being good. Experience has to be gauged and measured through truth. Sanctify them. In other words, prepare them. That's what sanctification means. Prepare. Get them ready. Oh, my God. Jesus is a bad somebody. He tells them, Father, I'm coming to you. Before I get to you, would you get them ready? I preached your gospel. I've done what you said to do. I have not lost any except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But in other words, I didn't lose any. He chose to be that guy. So, Father, sanctify them. Get them ready. Prepare them for the great jubilation and the great marriage supper of the Lamb that's coming. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's been, it'll be many generations, Father, before some of them hear the message. But none of them miss out on how good I am and how good you are. So would you take your word and put it in your heart, sanctify them through thy word, through thy truth, brother. Thy word is truth, my God. If God said it, he's good for it. I hear people say all the time, well, you know, God promised me this. If, he didn't, if it didn't come to pass, it wasn't God's fault. It's you, baby. <laughs> Woo, thank you, Jesus. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Father, we love you. <laughs> we give you praise. Oh, Jesus. Come on, just, just, just love him this morning. I don't, I don't know where I'm going. I'm just kind of here in this place of patience. Just love him. Just love him. Just love him. Just love him. Come on, just love him. Let, let your praise be voice activated. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let your praise be voice activated. Let your worship be voice activated. Ah, what has he done? What, is, what has he done? You know, the old folks in the old church used to say, he's, he saved us from danger seen and unseen. There are things that you and I, if the enemy had his way, you'd be gone. Yeah, you'd be with Jesus, but it ain't time for you to go to Jesus before the time. I did something so stupid the other day. It was just ignorant. It was ignorant. It was ignorant. I, I, I admittedly, it was ignorant. Ignorant. I was on, and of all highways, 380. 380 is probably one of the most dangerous highways in the United States, not just Iowa. Hope y'all know that, because it is. And I was on there, and I was trying to get over and I couldn't get over because just was unyielding, 
people were just not willing. And I was like, okay, should I speed up? Should I slow down? I mean, and it was just that thick. It was just that heavy. And I was trying to get, get off and go into North Liberty coming from, from, from I-80. And, and, and it was like, I had to make a decision. And I'm one of those guys that I'll go all the way up and turn around. A lot of people don't like, I saw somebody backing up on the highway the other day. I'm like, are you insane? It's just crazy what people will do. Well, so I was like, Lord, I'm looking at this big 18-wheeler, and he's unyielding. And I'm like, Lord, I got to get over. I mean, what do I do? And it was as if the Lord said, get on over. I mean, listen to me. Right at that time, though, and I got over. And in, in getting over, I moved. You know how y'all do. Come on, don't look at me like that. Don't look at me like that. Oh, I'm a professional driver. Okay, only when ain't nobody else watching. Anyway, and so I scooted over, and I went from, from my left lane straight across the right lane onto the exit. And I mean, that truck looked like he was a hair's breadth away from my tail end. And I, listen, but the reason why I say that, even in my stupidity, I had enough, enough God sense to say, thank you, Lord. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean to do it. How many things have you done that you didn't mean to do? Come on, the list is way too long for this room, from each one of us. But God's grace, his mercy. And because he's extended his mercy to us, why would we not extend it to other people? Why am I mad at my brother or my sister because they didn't do what I thought they should do? Don't be like the Judaizers in the book. Be like the Lord of the book and the Jesus of the book. Can we do that this morning? Lift your hands to the Lord. I look around the room and I see believers. I see people that are born again. That's such a joy to me. You know me, I don't, I don't really expect to see sinners. When they come, I'm delighted that they're here, but I don't, not in this type of crowd. The day will come when we are new, we're in our new facility and they will be there. Trust me, they will be there just to see what's going on, if nothing else. But I want to tell you today, don't get hung up on what you did yesterday. Don't let the love of God and the force of God's love stop you from what you had and you struggled with last week. God is long-suffering towards us. His mercy and his kindness is new every morning. So this morning, Father, just if you would agree with me in prayer, by faith in Jesus' name, I speak life and health and strength to your people, to the beloved of God. God, we love you. We don't go out. We're not intentional sinners deliberately uh, going against your desire and your will. We know what's right, what's wrong. You've taught us that through all of your scriptures and through all of the prophets and, 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 and people of God, the fivefold ministers of God that we've ever heard and the ones we see in scripture. We thank you, God, for examples in the word that show us that if you could use somebody like Paul or David again or, or any other, then you can use us. So today that's our approach to you. I approach you and I say of my own free will and my own love for you, I love you. Please forgive every transgression against your heart. Did y'all hear that? Against your heart, Lord. If it's not in your heart, if it's something that you didn't want me to do, I know that you'll show it to me by your Holy Spirit. I expect that. And I'll correct it. I won't do it again. But Father, I thank you that you simply love us with a love that will never end. And you've sent Jesus to show us that. 